unfolding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captain of a scientific technological elite. We've signed a climate convention on the importance of economic instruments and free markets were included in this mammoth uh, Agenda 21 document and the Rio Declaration. Now, let me be clear on one fundamental point. Uh, the United States fully intends to be the world's preeminent leader in protecting the global environment. Coming up, Technocracy News. Greetings, my friends from all around the world. This is Patrick Wood, editor-in-chief and founder of Technocracy.News, that is Technocracy News and Trends, where you will find everything you need to know about technocracy as an economic system, as a global meme, as the predecessor of sustainable development, Agenda 21, 2030 Agenda, New Urban Agenda, all those types of things from the United Nations as well. These things have permeated our country to an alarming extent. We're going to talk more about it today. Just when you think it was safe to get back in the water, a bigger shark appears swimming straight for you. And now it's been announced in headline number one, there's a frenzy taking place. Every major U.S. carrier has now launched 5G service. T-Mobile launched its 5G service in six U.S. cities over the weekend. Atlanta, Cleveland, Dallas, Las Vegas... Los Angeles, and New York. All four of the country's major carriers now offer 5G. The ultra-fast network, the article says, can be accessed on the Samsung Galaxy S10 5G, which retails for huh, a mere $1,299.99. The phone can access T-Mobile's LTE network in areas where 5G is unavailable. In a statement, T-Mobile CEO John Legary said the company's network would be, quote, broad, deep, and transformational. I might add he has that transformational part right. With the company's proposed merger to Sprint still pending before the government, Legary said approval would mean the combined companies could build, quote, the kind of 5G network America deserves. Well, heaven help us if this is what we deserve. Maybe it is what we deserve. People are so asleep at the switch, they don't know which way the sun comes up half the time. Well, as I said, 5G is coming forward whether we like it or not. Only we people are able to do anything to stop it or slow it down. And it depends on your local city, not on national government. The administration of this country, and in particular our president, Donald Trump, has said that we must win the battle to be first to implement 5G throughout our nation. I hasten to add, there is no race, truly. There's no reason we need to beat China on this, or any other country for that matter. Yet the race has been put before us. It's important for national security, they say, that we must beat everyone else to implement 5G. Well, when we implement 5G, it's going to light up the Internet of Things in a way that's never been done before, and the entire surveillance network around us will be ready to close in on us once and for all. It certainly won't do any good to call T-Mobile, Verizon, AT&T, or anyone else and complain about 5G because that won't slow them down. The only thing that slows them down is when a city, that is a city council, passes a resolution and throws up a huge stop sign and says, no, you're not doing it here. You're not putting your transmitters here. You're not putting your service here. We don't want it. And I might add, there are significant health questions that still need to be answered about 5G. The companies that are promoting it have no interest in sponsoring any studies to find out the health benefits. To them, basically, it's like a World War II movie where the submarine commander says, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. And that doesn't mean curse the torpedoes. It, it means put them in the tubes, lock the doors, and get them ready for firing. That's damn the torpedoes. So they're moving ahead whether we like it or not. The only possible block is at a city level at this point. Another article that caught my eye this morning that I posted on Technocracy News and Trends is about Baltimore. Baltimore has had a very interesting history in the last few years. It's been in the news many, many times for a number of reasons. But now Baltimore has revealed that it is on the fast track for smart city makeover. 
That is, the technology is coming in like crazy to the city, and they intend to completely remake the city in a new image of smart cities. The carrot, I might add, is always the same. This article points it out. Deliver sustainable solutions to economic growth and improve the lives of citizens. Well, that's a nice platitude, but the outcomes are seldom along those lines and most often are exactly the opposite. The cost of living goes up. Those that are close to poverty get marginalized even further and shoved into the poverty world. This article says smart city technologies empower cities to operate more efficiently by leveraging technology and Internet of Things sensors that deliver sustainable solutions to economic growth and improve the lives of citizens. Consider this a call to action to fast-track Charm City into Smart City, fully connected for the digital world. The article continues, One need look no further than our Rust Belt neighbor to the west, Pittsburgh, to find an American city that successfully made such a transition. Pittsburgh, once in dire economic straits after the decline of American steel, found a way to reinvent itself into Fast Company's 2019 Smart City of Future through outstanding technology investments that transformed the city into an ecosystem of innovation. By leveraging real-time traffic flow data to determine when traffic lights should turn green or red, thanks to smart traffic light technologies, intersection wait times in Pittsburgh have fallen by up to 40% travel times by as much as 25%, and auto emissions by up to 20%. Pittsburgh's also a testing ground for autonomous vehicles after Uber picked up the city to introduce driverless cars into its fleet. Driverless car sharing reduces the number of vehicles in operation and thus the amount of infrastructure expansion that's needed within a city. Plus, it allows for the cancellation of non-profitable city transportation services so cities can deploy driverless shuttle services at much reduced cost. Studies have already been shown, by the way, that driverless cars and ride-sharing services like Uber are indeed causing more congestion than they are relief. There's reasons for this. Number one, ride-sharing tends to increase the number of rides that people are taking because they don't need to fiddle with their car to get somewhere. They just need to tap an app. Car shows up, picks them up, and they go. So more rides are actually being taken as a result of these ride-sharing services. Autonomous vehicles, on the other hand, that have no driver whatsoever, as those spread, you'll find that there's no need for them to park themselves anymore, necessarily. A driverless car can drop you off at your destination. Let's say you're going to be there for 30 minutes, and you simply tell it to drive around the block for 30 minutes and then come back and pick me up. So for all the 30 minutes that it's driving around, it doesn't have to find a parking place, doesn't have to incur a parking fee, so driverless cars in big cities especially are not the answer to congestion. The article goes on to state, last year, Carnegie's Mellon University partnered with Pittsburgh International Airport, quote, to make it the smartest airport on the planet with sensors, apps, and other smart technologies helping travelers navigate the airport hassle-free from finding a parking place to obtaining the optimal time to arrive at airport security via your cell phone. Our call to action to fast-track Baltimore smart city investments comes with a sense of urgency regarding transportation. Traffic congestion alone costs Baltimore more than 1300 a year, that is, per person, according to a recent evaluation of urban traffic patterns. Last year, the city was listed as number eight on the 10 worst cities in America for the longest commute times, according to the U.S. Department of Transportation, and it was the lowest performing of all mid-sized cities. Incredibly, a typical Baltimore resident can only get to 11% of jobs in the region within one hour if they use public transportation, with the average commute time of 55 minutes. Well, I guess we could say Baltimore, go for it. But when you're all done spending the money for all this new renovation, smart city makeover, you're going to find that what you bought doesn't deliver what you thought. Any other American city should be watching areas like Baltimore very carefully to see what the impact is going to be on their city. The last article today is not so much of an article as it is a transcript of an interview that I did in June with Catherine Austin Fitz, a well-known economic commentator, author, publisher, journalist, analyst. She's the president of Solari Incorporated and the publisher of the Solari Report, 
also the managing member of Solari Investment Advisory Services. The reason this interview is important is because Catherine really understands technocracy. She really gets it. And why is that important? Well, consider this. She received her Bachelor of Arts degree in history from the University of Pennsylvania, 1974, then a Master's of Business Administration from the Wharton School. Then she studied Mandarin at the Yale and China Language Institute. She served as the Managing Director and member of the Board of Directors of the Wall Street Investment Bank, Dylan Reed and Company. She also worked as President of Hamilton Securities Group, an investment bank and financial software developer. Then she was the Assistant Secretary of Housing, the Federal Housing Commissioner at the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, in the administration of President George H.W. Bush. Catherine Austin Fitz has a stellar career. She's extremely bright. She's extremely well-educated. She has tons of experience. She studied economics and investments all of her life. And I want to tell you, she fully understands technocracy today. And so this interview was really important. She created a transcript of it, by the way, and I published that transcript on Technocracy News and Trends. Actually, I published a lot of it, but you'll have to click on the link to go see the entire thing. But I encourage you to do so. Read as much as you can. We covered a wide range of topics. We started out primarily talking about opportunity zones and how opportunity zones are going to pour potentially trillions of dollars into low-income communities around America. This is not what low-income communities need, by the way, to recover. And she, of all people, understands this perfectly. You don't just dump money by the bucketful into low-income areas and think something good's going to come out of it. All it ever does is just displace people that were formerly doing maybe okay, not rich, but okay, and it's going to dislocate people like crazy as rents rise, as businesses take over areas that can no longer be afforded, and the fact that Opportunity Zones are sponsored by a group of people who are known to be technocrats, you have to ask the question, what on earth is going on with Opportunity Zones? Well, I've written a couple of articles on it, on Technocracy News and Trends already. This interview just kind of nails the whole thing down, and Catherine's comments along the way are well worth considering. So I encourage you to... Take a look at this article. Check out her Solari Report website. That's solari.com, S-O-L-A-R-I, and get into the flow to understand more about technocracy. Now, I've been wanting to read from you a few paragraphs from a book that was written in 1932 by a gentleman by the name of Henry A. Porter. The title of the book is Roosevelt and Technocracy, and it's claimed in the cover page of the book that Henry A. Porter is a nationally known economist and financial analyst. I haven't been able to locate any independent information of Harry A. Porter, but that was the claim that he made, and he was also author of some other books, Profitless Prosperity, Gentlemen of America, Romance of Natural Gas, Research or Retrogression, and America's Greatest Tragedy. This book was published in hardback by Wetzel Publishing Company of Los Angeles, California, and Porter was an outspoken advocate of technocracy. I remind you, that this was in 1932. In the conclusion of his book, which was only 70 pages long, this is what he writes. In any national crisis, individualism must be submerged. We must all unite on a basis of equality. Surely we are not too hidebound to move forward courageously to an effective and unconventional reconstruction of our wealth and resources. The economic revolution is approaching with greater speed than we realize. Only skillful statesmanship, the statesmanship of a Roosevelt, and sound economic principles, the principles of technocracy, can successfully lead us out of the valley of chaos and despair into which we are plunging. Now, I want to point out that Porter calls the sound economic principles technocracy. These are not traditional economic principles. But he goes on, technocracy is the most constructive plan ever devised for the attainment of our economic stabilization. The gospel of technocracy is spreading through our schools, universities, and churches. Wall Street is exhibiting an intense but worried interest. And, it is whispered, even the Vatican is closely following the progress 
of this new brainchild of our engineer scientist. And remember, in 1932, Columbia University was the headquarters for the technocracy movement. Well, at least until it was discovered that the leader of the technocracy movement was a fraud and a charlatan. Porter goes on, technocracy will assure equality of economic rights. Can that be considered any more fantastic than equality of spiritual and political rights? Assuredly, technocracy will come. It is plain that its coming will be delayed by political maneuvering and financial chicanery. Though chastened and disillusioned, that spirit which brought the American people independence in 1776 will carry us through the chaos to victory and the heights of prosperity greater than the civilization has ever known. That we shall have to pass through a period of chaos is inevitable. The extent and severity of such a period is wholly within the control of the people. Radical and immediate changes in both our political and economic systems will be necessary. This can best be accomplished by vesting supreme and emergency power in some one man who has the confidence and respect of the majority of the American people. That man is Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in whom should be given dictatorial powers in the approaching crisis. We can depend on the innate courage, sound judgment, and true sportsmanship of the average American to gain his objective in a peaceful and orderly manner. This sounds like it could have been written by Alexandria Costa-Cortez and the Green New Deal. It'll bring chaos, they say, for a period of time, and it will. But back in 1932, the technocrats were willing to give dictatorial powers to Franklin D. Roosevelt so that he might just implement technocracy slam dunk. This technocrat dream has never died, my friends. It's still alive and well on planet Earth. It started out simply as a regional system that is in North America. Canada, Mexico, United States, Central America was part of it as well. So was the northern states in South America. They never agreed to technocracy, by the way, but the technocrat movement merely included them in the whole process and said, well, you're part of our technate too. And technocracy was rejected finally by the American people when they saw through it and saw that it was basically just crazy. But it's still with us, a resource-based economic system that looks exactly like sustainable development, by the way, which is pushed by the United Nations. And these people still get the idea that dictatorial powers will get us there faster than any other system of government that we have. So we should just get rid of the politicians altogether and appoint technocrats, those experts, those engineers and scientists who will use the scientific method to decide everything is necessary about society and the direction of society. If this doesn't sound like Brave New World to you, I don't know what does. And by the way, if you haven't read the book Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, you should beat a path to a used bookstore and pick up a copy for three or four bucks and read it. It won't take you long, but you get the idea of what a complete scientific dictatorship is going to look like in the end. And I have to say that Huxley was no friend of freedom and liberty, but he wrote the book with the inspiration from the technocrats, which at the same time that book was written in 1932, Porter was busy pounding out his book, Roosevelt and Technocracy. In fact, technocracy was the talk of the world at that point because it was at Columbia University. The president of Columbia at that point, Nicholas Murray Butler, a complete egomaniac, by the way, spent more time in Europe than he did in America for long stretches of time, loved to hobnob with the European crowd. One of his best friends was Benito Mussolini. But when Columbia University does something, people listen, and they did. And the book Brave New World popped out of the primordial stew. And we have it with us today, still. Same idea. Some of the names have changed. Some of the labels have changed. But the concepts are functionally identical to what was dreamed up and cooked up in 1932. I hope you have a glorious Independence Day with some rest and recuperation, maybe a barbecue, maybe some good conversation with friends. There's lots to talk about. I hope some of what you're able to talk about has to do with technocracy news and trends and some of the information that we're putting forward here. I'm Patrick Wood for Technocracy News and Trends. See you next time. Mm -hmm.